It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Speaker. My question this morning, my first question is to the Premier. Um, the Minister of Education uh, on November 18th said in this legislature, and I quote, it's, it is quite obvious, according to leading medical experts across this province, that transmission is not happening within school. This is, of course, in reference to COVID-19. So my question is, is this Premier and this government prepared to uh, stand behind that statement? To reply, the Minister of Education. Much, Mr. Speaker. It is the position of the Chief Medical Officer of Health from September to the present. He was asked just last week a question on the safety of schools, and he said and confirmed that schools have been safe in the province of Ontario, that three out of four schools in the province do not have a case of COVID, an active case, when we close them at the peak of the third wave. Mr. Speaker, we have put in place a $1.6 billion plan. We have followed the best medical advice. And according to medical officers of health in Ontario, the chief medical officer of health, and a variety of other pediatric institutions, including the scientific director of the Ontario Science Table, who said, quote, Ontario, unlike other places in the world, did a relatively good job. If you compare to the UK, our way of cohorting, our way of masking kids is much, much better, end, end quote. Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to follow that advice and most especially continue to invest to keep kids safe. Supplementary. Uh, speaker, uh, today's uh, Toronto Star reveals that on the very following day from when this minister made the claim uh, about schools being safe, his uh, ministry folks were hearing the exact opposite from experts at sick kids. In fact, Ministry of Education staff wrote the following note, and I quote, is there any transition happening in schools? We don't know. So why was the minister telling parents and teachers and kids and, in fact, members of this legislature that there was no transmission happening in schools while his own team was admitting that they didn't know? Minister of Education. Speaker, the principal advisor to the cabinet, to the government and the province of Ontario is the chief medical officer of health. Now, while I know when given the opportunity to affirm her public commitment to him, to the lead scientific leader of this province in the midst of a pandemic, they opted not to renew and instill confidence in him. But we have followed that perspective, and most especially in the context of our testing program, what we have noted is that we're one of the only provinces in the nation that has a targeted asymptomatic testing program. That is an additional layered approach to keeping schools safe. The principal testing agent in Ontario is the Ministry of Health. Last week alone, 20,000 tests were completed. In addition, the Ministry of Education brought in a targeted program to offset and complement um, testing within our schools to make it more accessible and more available for families. The Chief Medical Officer of Health, the head of the science table, the head of the pediatric, uh, the head of the Medical Officers of Health Council have been consistent and have been clear. Schools Response? in Ontario have been safe. We are grateful for the partnership with local public health and school boards, educators and parents to keep students safe in the province of Ontario. And the final supplementary. Thanks very much, Speaker. Well, you know, yesterday the Minister of Education made the same claim as he's making now, bragging about the in-school testing. And yet the, Scott, the Toronto Star reveals quite clearly that the testing was woefully inadequate. Uh, and in fact, Dr. Ashley Chute from the science table uh, calls the government's approach to testing scattershot uh, and says it was, quote, ultimately doing nothing in terms of our ability to take the data and make any sort of inference from it. In fact, the very best week of this government's testing in schools yielded 8,213 tests instead of the promised 50,000 tests that we've heard this minister brag about time and time again. So why did the government claim that their testing proved that schools were safe when they knew that that wasn't the case, and I'm sending the evidence over to the minister right now. Minister of Education, your what, has what has been uh, confirmed by the Chief Medical Officer of Health, according to his independent analysis of transmission in schools, is that they have been safe, that the layers of protection put in place by the province of Ontario following the best medical advice has worked to reduce transmission. When three out of four schools in the height of the third wave 
had no active cases at all, when 99% of students and 98% of staff had no case of COVID reported through the pandemic. That demonstrates that the $1.6 billion, that the uh, layers of protection and that the strict public health interventions we put in place from September, escalating them throughout the pandemic as the challenges changed throughout Ontario. It demonstrates that we were agile, that we followed advice, and we invested to keep kids safe. And the authority is not the Minister of Education, it's not the leader of the opposition, it is the Chief Medical Officer of Health who has been consistent in Response? this province from September through the present that schools have been safe. And we are grateful for the partnership to do that for the benefit of children in Ontario. The next question. Once again, the leader of the opposition. Speaker, my next uh, question is also for the Premier, but maybe this is the Minister's opportunity to get the transfer to a different ministry that he wants. Uh, teachers, education workers, public health experts, Speaker, have all been clear what is needed in our schools, and that means smaller classes, fixing backlog repairs that the Liberals uh, left us with, vaccinations, and an actual testing strategy that is robust, which we haven't had. Instead, what we've had is education cuts in the last budget, uh, the government, the Premier particularly, attacking our teachers and the government and this Premier claiming uh, that, uh, they, uh, that the experts were backing their plans when, in fact, he, they, they actually told him and he told, they told the Minister and, this, uh, and the Premier that they were literally flying blind. So, why did the government tell parents, schools, teachers, boards, everybody in this province that schools were completely safe when, in fact, they knew that they had really no idea whether they were or they weren't? Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Chief Medical Officer of Health has advised the people of Ontario in, when repeatedly asked about the safety of schools, transmission in schools, have suggested that the protections we put in place following his best advice from September has kept students and staff safe. That is his repeated position on the record in, to the people of Ontario literally for the past year. So the question for the Leader of the Opposition is why do you not take the advice of the Chief Medical Officer of Health um, and why not accept the independent analysis he has made with the various tables that inform him? that have built confidence for students and parents that our schools have been safe when 99% of students didn't have an active case, 98% of staff when three out of four schools didn't have an active case at all at the peak of the third wave. It underscores one truth, that the investment we put in place has worked. Now, with that said, Speaker, there are 7,000 more staff that were hired this year. 95% of schools had seen some upgrade to ventilation. We have 40,000 HEPA units and HEPA filters been improving air ventilation in schools, doubled the public health allocation. And yes, the only province in the nation with a targeted province-wide capacity to uh, conduct asymptomatic testing. That is very important, and we are proud of the work we have done. And we're going to continue to do everything we can for the benefit of students and for their safety in Ontario. Supplementary. It's really clear that uh, investment was needed to keep kids uh, safe at school, but um, that's not, not what's happened in this province. The Premier heard it from teachers, from boards, from the science table, that they needed to invest in our kids, but they just didn't want to. And in fact, the FAO report uh, just the other day indicates very clearly that this government has cut $800 million from education just in this budget, and over the next decade, those cuts will increase significantly. Cuts to the classroom will not help keep our kids safe. They just won't. That's the reason why our schools aren't open today. So why is the Premier cutting education in this province? Why is the Premier doing that when it's clear to everyone that our kids need and deserve more investment Question. now? They need it now more than ever before. Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, the reason why schools were closed in the province, according to the Chief Medical Officer of Health, is because community transmission spiked to roughly 4,000 cases a day. That is the reason, and the member opposite knows it to be true. 
That's why we closed schools. That's why Nova Scotia announced closures in our regional bases. That's why BC did so in a targeted basis. We have to respond to risk profiles that change. When cases rise in the community, they're reflected in schools. We close them to protect families. We did that repeatedly. In the context of funding, we increased investment by $2 billion as we look forward to September, a $1.6 billion provincially funded increase in resources for COVID, a $500 million increase in the grant for student needs, and a targeted $85 million support for summer learning and learning gaps. We've also quadrupled mental health funding. How can the member opposite suggest there's a reduction in expenditure? In the FAO report, when it comes to methodology, the FAO suggests uh, in the context of methodology that there is that the, the Ministry of Education does not forecast based on compensation hikes he makes assumptions on what those hikes may be we do not when it comes to the invest thank you thank you the final supplementary yet another government attacking an independent officer speaker it's just getting a bit tired but look when it comes to parents when it comes government to side, students come to order. when it comes to teachers Everybody is desperate to get back Order. into the classroom. Why? Because their kids are suffering. They're suffering from mental health challenges. They're suffering from loneliness. Parents are so worried about their kids and what's happening to them because they can't go to school. And in fact, this government promised that schools would be the first to open and the last to close. Experts, of course, say that that's essential for the mental health of our kids, and it needs to be done safely and on a regional basis. Uh, however, to do that, we need to have that safety and we need to have that investment. Today, just moments ago, uh, the Star reported that the Ford government uh, is not ready to do that, to make those investments and open those schools. Uh, apparently, they're more interested in question. classroom budget cuts than in protecting our kids, which is absolutely shameful. So my question is, is the, re the report from the Star accurate today? Will the Premier keep his promise to kids and make the investments to ensure that they do come first in reopening? Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, the government is committed to continuing to invest in schools. It's why we announced some weeks ago a significant enhancement in funding for September. Even though we know that all students will be double vaxxed for those that want it, 12 and up, uh, by September, and likewise for our education staff and the general population, uh, so long as supply continues to come in, even though we know that the world will change and will hopefully be much better and safer for communities and for schools. We still are funding it at 100%, still maintaining the double, doubling of public health nurses, still having the only province with an asymptomatic testing program, still having PPE being provided for, for free, three-ply three ply masks for all students, still ensuring cohorting and all the public health measures we put in place this year that the science table chair, as well as the chief medical officer of health has said, has resulted in safe schools. When 99% of students are safe, 98% of staff, Response. we can be confident that the program we put in place will keep, has kept students safe, and we will continue to invest and continue to support parents, families, and children in Ontario. Thank you. The next question, the member for Scarborough Southwest. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Amaya, a seven-year-old from Scarborough Southwest, has been facing an incredible amount of difficulty over the past year with online learning. She cannot focus and misses the support that she used to receive uh, from her educator during in-class learning. When the province finally announced that in-person learning may be available for children with special needs, like Amaya, her mother made the request to her school with no success. My question to the Premier is, Mr. Speaker, what option do students like Amaya have? And what does, what has this government done to ensure that accessibility and accommodations for special needs children are prioritized throughout this pandemic? Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. You know, it, it, I should have noted in the last question and the last answer rather, you know, when the leader of the opposition speaks about the importance of open schools, it was the opposition parties who stood with the unions at the time who called for the government not to reopen schools in February and January. Order. They advocated for keeping schools closed until the state home order lifts. That is their position. And they would have kept school closed throughout 2021. We moved mountains working with every medical officer, with a chief medical officer, seeking external counsel, pediatric institutions, to get them open, to keep them safe. In the context of virtual learning, another choice that would have been removed. They would not have offered parents a choice of virtual learning. 
And yes, one in four parents opted for it. They may into September. We think that choice is a strength, recognizing in-class learning must be safe, which is why we invested for it. In the context of what, are we, what we're doing to support virtual learning, we've added an additional $200 million investment to support it. Response? Over 150,000 tablets have been procured. 10,000 internet connections and a significant increase, including last year and this year forthcoming, to ensure families can get access to devices and supports that they need. Supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, it's shameful that I asked about a, a, a question about a seven-year-old who needs special needs support, and the minister decided to use his opportunity to answer and throw political punches at the opposition, and then he went on to advocate for, for privatization or for uh, online learning. Uh, I, I am, I am at, at a loss of words because I'm talking. Order. And again, the minister is going to interrupt me while I ask my questions. Speaker, we cannot let students lose a year's worth of learning and development and progress. Students and educators and families are exhausted. They are waiting for this government to make immediate investments in safer, smaller class sizes, upgrade ventilation, and give resources for students with disabilities. For weeks, Amaya's family has been given the runaround, and I hope the minister will move mountain to help kids like Amaya, like many other families who are trying to access support. Despite having all the documentation like medical notes, Amaya is still on a wait list to be considered for in-person learning and accommodations. So my question is, Mr. Speaker, why is the government failing students like Amaya and so many others across this province? Mr. Education. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to virtual learning, yes, it is important to start on the basis that we are the only party in the legislature that have provided that family with that choice. Step one. Step two, in the context of our funding for virtual learning, we have increased the investment by $225 million, which, would, which has provided literally over 195,000 devices uh, that have been procured this year. We have nearly 10,000 internet connections. In Toronto District School Board Survey, nine in 10 families currently have access to their own devices um, that were provided in part by the boards. We've done an incredible amount of work to build up the infrastructure. Remember, we set a high standard in Ontario. We set the highest standard in the nation, three, that, that at least 75 uh, Seventy percent of the 300 minutes of instruction must be done in live, synchronous Zoom learning. That was opposed by the members opposite. High standards, access to the choice, and of course, in the context of mental health supports and special education, given the circumstance of the family you've mentioned, we've increased Response? federal funding by 3.2 billion. It's the highest levels ever recorded in Ontario history, and we've quadrupled mental health funding from the former Liberal government at the peak of their spending to 80 million, representing a 400 percent increase in supports for kids. Thank you. Next question, the member for Brampton West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Last week, the minister stood up in this house and provided us with an update on our government's vaccine rollout. She let us know that we achieved our goal of providing a first dose of COVID-19 vaccine to over 65% of all Ontarians over the age of 18 ahead of schedule. Not even a week later, and our province has already surpassed another milestone by administering over 9 million doses to Ontarians across the province. Mr. Speaker, my constituents are eager to get both their first and second doses so they can get back to the most important things like spending more time with friends and family. Would the minister please tell the members of this house how our government plans to accelerate vaccines to those most vulnerable across the province? The Deputy Premier and Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Brampton West for his question, for his incredibly hard work on behalf of his constituents. Since day one, Speaker, our government has been committed to vaccinating Ontarians as quickly and as safely as possible. That's why, starting yesterday, we opened up the eligibility for accelerated second-dose appointments, starting with individuals aged 80 and over, beginning as of May 31st. For those who want to get their second dose sooner, appointments can be rebooked through the provincial booking system, call centre, public health units and through pharmacies. If there is sufficient vaccine supply, anticipate that the majority of Ontario residents will be able, who choose to receive the vaccine will be able to be fully vaccinated by the end of summer. Speaker, we are going to do everything that we can to make sure that our, the most vulnerable in our communities receive their second vaccine doses as quickly as possible. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Minister, and thank you to all those on the front lines for helping us administer these crucial vaccines. Mr. Speaker, it's reassuring to hear the Minister talk about our plan to ensure that most vulnerable, like our seniors over 80, are able to receive the second dose 
they need ahead of schedule. If the success we have seen, for, seen so far with our vaccination rollout is any indication of what's to come, Ontarians can rest assured that we are well on our way to fully vaccinating everyone who wants it to wants to be by the end of summer. I know a number of factors were considered when determining how to accelerate our vaccination program. Mr. Speaker, would the minister please tell this House how more Ontarians can expect to get their second doses sooner over the summer? Minister of Health. Yes, and thank you again very much for the question. To support this accelerated rollout, the province has developed an anticipated schedule for eligibility to accelerate second doses based upon confirmed supply. This began yesterday with individuals turning 80 and over in 2021, becoming eligible to rebook their second dose appointment for a sooner date if they wish to do so. Next, individuals age 70 and over are scheduled to begin doing the same the week of June 14th. The rollout will continue to expand eligibility for second dose appointments based upon the date of the first dose. Mr. Speaker, we will continue to further accelerate the rollout of second doses as the federal government determines and confirms increased vaccine deliveries. Accelerating second doses will provide more protection to Ontarians sooner. Every dose administered means we are one step closer to the end of the Response. pandemic, and I encourage all Ontarians to get vaccinated and continue following public health advice. Thank you. The next question, the member for Kiwetanong. Thank you, uh, Speaker, uh, to the Premier. Uh, today, uh, we are collectively uh, still in a time of grief and reflection. We grieve for the 215 children found on the site of former residential school in Kamloops and the thousands of children we know that never came home. These children should have lived their full lives and their grandchildren would be here today. And these people uh, and this province deserve justice and they need it today, not, not uh, decades from now. Yesterday, the government committed to searching former residential school sites, a search that should be indigenous-led. But things are going, if things are going to happen and uh, change, we need to see funding timelines from this government. When can we expect a, a real plan from this government to back up their commitment to Indigenous people? Miigwech. To reply, the government house leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, as uh, the member knows, uh, we, uh, uh, both myself and the Minister of uh, uh, Indigenous Affairs and the Premier made this commitment uh, yesterday, so we will, as a uh, uh, said uh, yesterday, uh, it is important, as the member has just said, that we work with First Nations uh, to ensure that this gets done uh, in a way that is both uh, uh, respectful of the traditions of, of the First Nations and uh, uh, is, is done in a way that ensures that we are able to uh, uh, fully investigate and, and ensure that uh, we, are, we are doing uh, uh, really what, uh, as the member said, what should be led by First Nations and making sure that uh, uh, we get this done appropriately. Uh, I don't think anybody is going to disagree with the, with the member uh, with the, the member opposite. I know that uh, uh, the premier and the minister are uh, very much in line with that, and we will be working very closely, continuing to work very closely with First Nations to ensure that it gets done. Supplementary, the member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Um, and respectfully, back to the government house leader. What I didn't hear there was an actual commitment to funding. Speaker, entire generations of children were lost to residential schools. As Indigenous people living in Canada today, we're all survivors of Canada's genocide. Despite the ongoing systemic racism that attempts to erase us, we're still here. Ontario must confront its colonial past and take action to secure justice for all those who survived the trauma of residential schools and who are still experiencing the harmful intergenerational impact today. We need funding, a commitment to funding from this government to search the grounds of all the former residential schools in Ontario for all of the lost children. And that funding has to come with a commitment that that search is Indigenous-led. Will this government follow through on, the, on their commitments today, provide a plan, provide funding, provide a commitment that the search of the residential schools will be Indigenous-led? Will you do that today so that we can have justice for survivors and their families? 
I apologize. I thought it was very clear yesterday that we are making that commitment to uh, fund uh, this, Mr. Speaker. I thought I was clear yesterday that it would be uh, uh, that we would be working with the Indigenous community to ensure that it is done in a respectful. Uh, manner, Mr. Speaker. I know that the minister, uh, Minister Rickford, uh, reiterated uh, that just yesterday. So, if I need to be even clearer, uh, yes, absolutely, positively, this is extremely important. This is not something that uh, a week from now we will forget just because it's out of uh, out of the out of, out of the news cycle. As uh, uh, we we heard the words of the member from Kewatin yesterday. Very, very powerful words. We see what's uh, out front of this legislature, and we see what is happening across this country, and people want us to build on the work that we have done, uh, 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 the Minister uh, Rickford has, uh, has done. But on this issue, yes, uh, I, I don't know if I, how much more clear than that I can be. Response. The answer is yes. Thank you. The next question, the member for Cambridge. Thank you, Speaker. Good morning. My question is for the Premier. A couple of weeks ago, before the long weekend, the government unveiled a roadmap to reopening, which actually contained no indication of when life would get back to normal or fully reopen. And at the same time of the press conference, the government began debate to extend emergency powers under Bill 195, the Reopening Ontario Act, until December. In the plan, they have followed with the approach of Justin Trudeau and Dr. Theresa Tam, linking vaccine rates to a limited return to some everyday activities, but have not indicated how many Ontarians receiving a vaccine it will take to allow for life to return to normal, if they ever plan to let life return to normal. If 80% of Ontarians receiving a vaccine is not enough for a return to normal under this plan, what is the number? Is it 100%? And to respond, the Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. Well, the roadmap to reopen is uh, based on uh, vaccination rates, of course. To uh, get into stage two, one, we need to reach 60% of all adults over 18 being, having been vaccinated, which has already happened. We're at, at least at 67% as of things stand now, with over 9.2 million vaccines already have been administered. But there's also some public health indicators that also need to be uh, met in terms of the number of new cases. Today, we are down to 699 cases, which is a huge improvement. There still is a ways to go, but it's also based on number of people being uh, admitted to our intensive care units, the, uh, the R factor, the public health ability to recover, but these are realistic uh, indications and numbers based on what our medical uh, experts have advised us and what the modeling has shown us. So we are gradually and carefully reopening Response. because the last thing we want to go into is a fourth wave, but we have been advised that the levels that we have suggested for the roadmap to reopen is realistic and achievable. And the supplementary question. Speaker, with this government, the goalposts are always moving. In January 2021, we were told life would get back to normal with 1,000 positive cases per day. By May, we heard it was 500 to 600 cases. Now, apparently, case rate has nothing to do with it. As the minister just said, it's about vaccine rates. But the fine print of the government's plan, as she, again she said, also says, plus key health indicators. This vagueness is not a plan. And coupled with the extension of emergency orders until December, it suggests they have no plan to reopen our province. Can the Premier please publicly disclose to Ontarians what is meant by these plus key health indicators, part of the plan, that is in addition to vaccine rates, rates we want exact numbers. This is a limited reopening plan. What is it dependent on? Minister of Health. Thank you. Well, the road to reopen is very clear with three stages that we will need to move through very carefully in order to be able to reopen the province. We've seen what's happened with the variants of concern that are still out there, that we need to move very, very carefully through this to slowly, gradually reopen the province. But as the member would see from stage three, that we are going to then be opening the last areas that haven't been op opened for a very long time, things like uh, closed-in cinemas, concerts, all of those other areas that will be met and will be available based on these achievable targets that have been clear, very clearly disclosed to the people of Ontario. In addition to the vaccination rates, there's the hospitalization rates, the ICU factors, the public health rates, the R factor. All of those have been very, very clearly 
regularly discussed with the people of Ontario. And as I indicated earlier, these are realistic and achievable targets. The people of Response. Ontario are helping very much with having receiving the vaccinations. We've been able to accelerate the second doses, and we are confident that we'll be able to hit these milestones and be able to open Ontario back up at the appropriate. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brampton West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Solicitor General. Uh, we know that stricter border measures drop the spread of COVID-19. This reality is backed up by hard evidence and data. All the cases that we have in Ontario can be traced back to origin outside of Ontario. Ontario is finally getting closer to opening yet. Now we are hearing about the federal proposal to on lifting border restrictions. We know that it isn't yet just about international travelers from overseas. COVID-19 can enter Ontario from the United States too. So can the Solicitor General remind the House what our government's position is on opening our borders so soon? General. Thank you, and thank you to the member from Brampton West for this important uh, issue that he has raised. I and we have consistently called on the federal government to enhance our safeguards at our border. It's disappointing, but unfortunately doesn't surprise me that the federal government is looking for ways to reopen the the border. The Prime Minister needs to take the border issue seriously, but instead he keeps ignoring Ontario's concerns. Ontario is starting to see some incredible progress as a result of everyone's sacrifices. Finally, we can see our numbers gradually coming down. Our vaccines are at a record level, averaging approximately a million doses a week. It's time for the Prime Minister to take this seriously, just like we are, and address the border issue by implementing stronger requirements, not by seeking out ways to remove them. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister. We are all aware of how the original COVID-19 uh, virus got here. It was through travel. Every variant of concern that filled our ICUs came from outside of Ontario. Although we all look forward to our American friends being able to visit once again, now is not the time. Back to the minister. Can she explain why this is not the time to have a return of American travelers? Solicitor General, to once again reply. We know that mobility is a factor in the spread of COVID, which is why that now is not the time to open our borders. Yesterday, I spoke about the importance of our border controls with our neighboring province of Manitoba and how it is working. On one side of the border, cases are increasing, and we will continue to help Manitobans with 34 Manitobans currently in Ontario's ICUs. Ontario has had to make great sacrifices to get to the point where the stay-at-home order is being lifted at 12.01. Last night, for the first time in months, there were hockey fans in person watching the Leafs game, and despite the unfortunate results, the return of sport is an exciting step in the right direction. We have seen how just a few travellers infected with the new variant can set us back literally for months. This is not the time for the federal government to lift restrictions at our borders. Thank you. Thank you. And the next question, the member for Brampton East. Thank you, Speaker. Since the beginning of this pandemic, I have repeatedly stood in this House and raised the alarm about Brampton's health care crisis. Brampton has only one hospital, Brampton Civic, and it has been pushed to the limits as frontline workers there have cared for Bramptonians who are struggling to breathe during this devastating third wave. We have consistently had the highest positivity rates, and our hospital has struggled to care for people who are getting sick across our city. On the weekend, the Toronto Star published a story where they shared the harrowing accounts of healthcare workers at Brampton Civic who had to deal with this pandemic firsthand. Jennifer Shields, a registered nurse, described how COVID-19 hit Brampton Civic. She said, now we see whole families, the mom and dad upstairs on a ventilator, the son coming into our ER because he can't breathe. This time around, it really feels like more of a nightmare. When will the Conservative government finally work to stop this COVID-19 nightmare in Brampton by giving us the resources we need to fight and beat COVID-19? My question is to the Premier. The Deputy Premier, the Minister of Health. 
Thank you very much, Speaker. And to the member opposite, I, I would say through you, Mr. Speaker, that Brampton has been receiving uh, extra resources and extra help, recognizing that there are a number of uh, traditional hotspots in the Brampton area, as well as hotspots that have been further identified by the local medical officer of health. That is why we uh, took into a, a fact, that into effect, along with other hotspots in the province of Ontario. And for two weeks during the month of May, we took 50% of the vaccines that were coming in and dedicated them to the hotspot areas in order to boost the vaccination rates and make sure that people would be properly protected from COVID-19. That strategy has been extremely successful, and I could advise the House through you, Mr. Speaker, that we now have areas in the hotspot areas that have 8 percent more people vaccinated than in non-hotspot areas. Brampton received its share because of the number of hotspot areas that were identified, and we'll continue to follow up with all of the Spons? clinics that we have for to continue with first and second doses. And the supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. Brampton has been left behind by the Conservative government since day one of this pandemic. Brampton has been, but because Brampton has been fighting and organizing, we've been able to get supports because of our advocacy. The Conservative government left Brampton behind when it came to testing. The Conservative government left behind Brampton behind when it came to vaccines. But because we organized, we were able to get the 50% allocation of vaccines that Brampton and other hotspots required. But now, just as we're turning the corner and finally bringing cases down, the Conservative government is going against the recommendations of the science table and halting the 50% allocation of vaccines to yep. COVID-19 hotspots. We are not out of the woods yet. This is a pandemic, and we can't stop now that we're finally getting ahead of this virus. Will the Conservative government finally listen to the science, do the right thing, and make sure that Brampton and other hotspots continue Question. to get the 50% allocation of vaccines that we need so we can beat COVID-19? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker. And through you, uh, Mr. Speaker, I would advise the member opposite that several of the items that he mentioned are simply not the case. With respect to the recommendations of the science advisory table on the 50% of the doses being allocated for a longer period of time, that was before they realized that we were receiving almost double the number of doses from the federal government. So in actual fact, we have fulfilled the wishes of the uh, science advisory table. and. As as I indicated earlier, that strategy has been incredibly successful with boosting the number of people in hotspot areas receiving the vaccine over non-hotspot areas. So Brampton, because they've had that number of hotspot areas identified, they have been well treated by this strategy and continue to be well treated with the vaccine rollout in the sense that there are over 150 pharmacies in Peel that are seven of which are operating 24 7. there are 40 primary care sites four hospitals and Spons? 18 over 18 over pop-up sites in uh, hotspot areas so uh, brampton is receiving its fair share first of doses with respect to availability of vaccines and with respect to uh, accessibility for people to increase their uh, second doses by accelerating them further brampton is receiving more than its fair share as compared to thank you thank you the next question <laughs> member for ottawa vanier thank you mr speaker my question is to the minister of health the opioid crisis in our communities has reached an alarming threshold and this health crisis requires more attention from the province drug use overdoses and addictions continue to increase costs to governments for services such as shelters health care and emergency services. Both Ottawa and Toronto have seen a very concerning increase in overdose during the pandemic. And this is not only true for those, both cities, but it's also true for the rest of the province. We hear about this crisis like every day. So my question is, what is the government currently and actively doing to mitigate the impacts of the opioid crisis and protect vulnerable Ontarians? The Minister of Health. Thank you. Well, I thank the member very much for this question. This is an extremely important issue. Uh, there is no denying the fact that the opioid crisis has 
increased with the pandemic, and we take this crisis very seriously. That is why we have, uh, first of all, approved and funded 16 consumption and treatment services sites in Ontario with others uh, with pending applications. So the CTS sites not only save lives by preventing overdose-related deaths, but it also connects people to primary care and other services in the event that they are ready to enter rehabilitation and treatment. In addition, we have also invested up to $194 million in emergency mental health and addictions funding to expand easily accessible mental health and addictions care during this COVID-19 pandemic. It is something that there is more work to do, but we have certainly identified this as a priority and we are working towards expanding those services and funding. Order. Supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again to the Minister of Health for my follow-up. Mr. Speaker, mayors of Ottawa and Toronto are both asking for the province to do more to address this crisis that continues to take the lives of so many people. A safe supply of drugs has proven to drastically change the lives of those who use drugs in addition to the surrounding communities, businesses and residents. During the COVID-19 period, it has become even more clear how current responses are not sufficient in protecting our residents and communities from the negative impact of addictions. The Ministry of Health said it was looking into a safer supply program. That was back in February, but there has been no update yet. So will the government commit to supporting the expansion of safe supply to provide immediate support to address this alarming health care issue and bring relief to our communities? Minister of Health. Well, our government is, is committed to providing more supports for people struggling with a mental health or addictions crisis. Our roadmap to wellness was uh, initiated just before the COVID pandemic struck last March. We are committed to putting $3.8 billion into uh, our uh, mental health and addiction system. Over the next 10 years, we put in $175 million new next funds for last year, $176 million this year. We into both mental health and addictions funding. There will be an announcement with respect to mental health funding later on today, and addictions funding coming uh, very shortly. However, I can advise that we have, in addition to the uh, consumption and treatment services site, we've put $4 million to nurse practitioners for detox services to improve the medical management of clients who are withdrawing from substance use, $8 million for Question. addiction stay and evening care, and $3.5 million for in-home and mobile withdrawal management services. And there is certainly more to come, but as I indicated earlier, we do take this very seriously and are taking action. Thank you. The next question, the member for Brampton West. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. Our government, in consultation with the Chief Medical Officer of Health, recently released its roadmap to reopen a three-step plan to safely and cautiously reopen the province and gradually lift public health measures. This was great news for our province and great news for the sectors this minister represents. Having said this, many tourism industry small businesses in our province are going to need assistance to safely reopen after having been shuttered for so long. Can the minister tell us how the Ontario Tourism and Travel Small Business Grant has been supporting these sectors since it was announced a few, few weeks ago? Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. Thank you very much, Speaker. And I want to thank the Honourable Member for the question. It's important that we continue to talk about Ontario's hardest hit sectors uh, in this legislature so that when we eye economic and social recovery, we'll be prepared. And that's why we have, uh, in conjunction with the, um, with the Ministry, for York of Finance, Center, come to order. Ministry of Government social, and the Government and Consumer Services, as well as the Ministry of uh, Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade, created the $100 million Ontario Tourism and Travel Small Business Grant. To date, we've paid out over $13.1 million dollars uh, to small businesses across the province with an average payment of up to $17,000 uh, and it takes about six days to approve the payment. This is incredibly important as we continue to uh, invest in in our uh, sectors. Uh, we are going to be announcing another $100 million for tourism uh, recovery, as well as later this summer, we'll be able to enact the $150 million travel incentive because we want to make sure that Response. the travel and tourism industry is going to be protected as we move forward. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister. It sounds like these tourism small businesses are taking advantage of this great program 
and it must be very beneficial to be able to use the support in whatever way makes the most sense for this, uh, their business. There's no question that these small businesses have suffered dram dramatically throughout this pandemic. With our government announcing its roadmap to reopen, what other supports is this government providing to help these tourism businesses succeed when they can reopen? Thank you very much. Um, as you know, uh, we have the $150 million travel incentive, the $100 million uh, travel and tourism uh, uh, business, uh, small business tax credit, as well as the, uh, the grant, sorry, as the, as the $100 million recovery fund. And uh, we are going to continue to make significant investments into our regional tourism organizations. And I'm, I'm delighted to say that Michael Crockett, president and CEO of the Ottawa Tourism, uh, recently said, Ottawa Tourism welcomes the support of the Ontario government as it recognizes that the Ontario in uh, tourism industry was hit first hardest will take the longest to recover from the effects of the pandemic. Owners of tourism businesses have been resilient and creative over the past 14 months, and while several aid programs have been launched, some businesses have still fallen between the cracks. Programs such as this are incredibly helpful, allowing businesses to continue employing Ontarians and contributing to the vibrant quality of life we enjoy. We have a spectacular double bottom line within this ministry, Speaker, and I am intent on making sure that we continue to preserve and protect it. Thank you. The next question, the member for Kitchener Centre. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Last year, this government snuck in a degree-granting university for Charles McVitie. They put it into legislation that was meant to help small and medium-sized businesses. Thankfully, the review board, PCAB, rejected the application. Today, we can all put this entire Charles McVitie University behind us. I have new legislation that will be tabled that will rip up that deal between the government that they cut with their buddy Charles McVitie. It will also bring new accountability and transparency to the PCAB process so Ontarians will see how these decisions are made. And being Pride Month, it's never been a more fitting time to take a stand against bigotry and intolerance. So it's a simple question, Mr. Speaker. Will the government do the right thing and support my bill this week? Yes or no? The Parliamentary Assistant, Member for Northumberland, Peterborough South. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, as we've said from day one, this government values and will always lean on the expert, independent advice of the Post-Secondary Education Quality Assessment Board. We've said we would respect their decisions, and we've done just that. Thank you, Speaker. Please supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and back to the Premier. Charles McVitie's College is campaigning to keep this legislation on the books and to ensure it receives royal assent for it. They're claiming widespread fraud and alleging damage to their reputation. Speaker, Ontarians have had enough of this nonsense. The House leader himself said in an interview on Monday that this has been difficult for his government. It's time to turn the page on this troubling chapter brought to us by this government. The government can support our bill, rip up this legislation. So my question is simple. Why won't they do it? Again, the parliamentary assistant. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, as the government said, we rely on the expert independent advice of the PCAB process, and we've done just that. Mr. Speaker, it's uh, leaning on independent processes like that that we've seen an expansion of OCAD University, of Algoma in the North. It's leaning on those independent processes that we've seen our high-quality post-secondary education sector expand in this province, a sector that has expanded through OSAP eligibility for Indigenous Institutes, something that this government's worked on that I've really enjoyed working in partnership with our Indigenous Institutes on. It's through that that we've expanded mental health supports to support our students through uh, the challenging COVID-19 realities. It's through uh, working with our sector, uh, Mr. Speaker, and working with the independence of the, of the universities and colleges and, and how they're governed that we've expanded for the first time in over 20 years nursing seats to support in our Herculean commitment to bring in 27,000 more healthcare workers. Mr. Speaker, we respect the independence of our academic institutions and the independence of the PCAB process, as we said from day one. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for York Centre. Thank you, Speaker. To the Minister of Education, we've all been hearing from parents across the province. We heard the 70% sick kids study, kids helpline calls doubling, Hamilton Children's Hospital, and CHEO. We all heard the Canadian Pediatric Society, that Ontario's kids are increasingly anxious, depressed, and suicidal. What can be more important than that? The minister stood in front of this house for months and pontificated that schools are safe, that there is no transmission. I agree, but not because of ministry or public health abracadabra, but because they're kids. 
They don't transmit much. We know this already. So when the pressure got to this premier, he started blaming the teachers' unions and threats of injunction for not opening the schools. Then, instead of listening to the chief medical officer who wanted to open schools, the premier wrote to 54 stakeholders looking for political cover and still got the same advice, almost unanimously, open the schools. So why, minister, despite the advice, the lack of transmission, the harm done to our kids, why aren't Ontario schools open today? The government house leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the, the question from uh, the Honourable Gentleman. As you know, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, uh, this is, of course, a member who has uh, uh, come both ways on this uh, for months. Uh, he was very supportive of the measures that this government uh, has, had taken in, in order to ensure that the safety of the people of the province of Ontario. He, of course, was very supportive of, uh, of, uh, of measures taken March, April, May, June. July, uh, Mr. Speaker, and then back in September. We learned yesterday, though, of course, that uh, his efforts from September, October, November, and December were actually not for him, but were for our benefit, Mr. Speaker. Uh, so I, I thank him for the sacrifices that he made uh, in helping, in attempting to help this government, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the Minister of Education has always made sure that our, our schools are safe and the people of the province of Ontario are safe despite the transition of the member opposite to somebody who no longer seems to have that as a priority. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. To the Minister of Health. For 15 months, the Minister and Premier told us they were listening to Dr. Williams, until Dr. Williams wanted to open schools, and they didn't. Two days later, they announced that Dr. Williams is getting replaced. But in fact, Speaker, that was not the first time they didn't listen to Dr. Williams. Williams testified before the Long-Term Care Commission that he did not believe in asymptomatic transmission until late summer. Speaker, the rationale for the lockdown is stopping the spread of asymptomatic transmission to keep 15 million people, Ontarians, at home. But why? If Williams didn't believe in asymptomatic transmission last spring, then why did we go into lockdown? My question to the Minister of Health. Is it a coincidence that Dr. Williams is getting replaced after publicly wanting to open Ontario schools and if Dr. Williams did not believe in asymptomatic spread until last summer, as he said under oath, then does the minister deny that the decision to go into lockdown was a political decision and not a medical decision? The government house leader. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, look, uh, uh, the, the only person who seems to really be flip-flopping is the, is the member opposite. We have been very clear from, uh, from day one that it was our intention to ensure that the Order. safety and security of the people of the province of Ontario. We uh, enthusiastically uh, voted in, to ensure that safety, uh, Mr. Speaker. On many occasions, in fact, the member opposite did just the same. As I've said, uh, he did so in March, April, May, uh, enthusiastically. Member for York Centre, come to order. Now, now we're finding out, he says, who cares, Mr. Speaker? So now we're finding out that the members' votes never really matter. Order. The Minister of Heritage, come to order. Member for York Centre, come to order. Member for Hamilton Mountain, come to order. Leader of the Opposition, come to order. I'll allow the Government House Leader to conclude his answer. Uh, look, Mr. Speaker, I think when the member just said, who cares how he votes, I think that speaks uh, volumes about him. Now I understand why the member for Ottawa, Vanier and Cambridge and, and the House Leader for the Liberal Party seem to sink down in their seats every time he gets up and asks a question. <laughs> The next question, member for Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question to the Premier. Premier, today is Injured Workers' Day. This is a day when injured workers demand respect and demand not to be ignored. They're fighting because in this province right now, injured workers are four times more likely to live in poverty once they're injured. One in five workers are living in extreme poverty after an injury which is less than $10,000 per year, and just over 40% report an income of less than $15,000 a year. One in five workers in this province have lost their homes because of an injury. One of the ways we can stop this is by immediately outlawing the practice of deeming and making WSIB focus on helping injured workers like it was supposed to. Will the Premier support my bill? Bill 119 today and make that a reality? Or is he proud of Ontario's record when it comes to injured workers having to live in poverty? Government House Leader. 
Uh, yeah, look, Mr. Speaker, uh, as I've said on a number of occasions, uh, uh, when members bring uh, bills forward, private members' bills forward, I expect them to work with their colleagues on both sides of the House to, uh, uh, to gain support uh, for those bills so that uh, when it comes to, to committee and if it does make it back into the House, uh, that a majority of the House uh, supports that bill. So, uh, really, Mr. Speaker, uh, I, I'm certainly not going to, uh, uh, as, as a government House leader, uh, order that people on all sides of the House uh, do the work that I know the member opposite is very passionate about. I know he will continue to do that work. I know he's passionate about his private member's bill. And I know that he will continue to reach across both sides of the aisle so that when it does come back to this House for third reading, uh, he hopefully will have the support of the entire House and all members on both sides. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again to the Premier. Injured workers have been clear under this government. If you are injured at work, you have a 50% chance of living in poverty. Under this minister, being injured to work is a sentence to a life in poverty. They are also clear WSIB is broken. It's failing workers in the province of Ontario. Even during the pandemic, it has been denied benefits for over 800 frontline health care workers. Will the minister or the premier stand up today, tell injured workers that they are right, that WSIB is broken and has failed them, and commit to fixing it? Will they commit to supporting two bills I have tabled before you, one to end deeming and one to provide every frontline worker, our heroes that you call heroes, who catches COVID-19 with presumptive coverage so they can get the benefits they need and deserve. Thank you. Look, again, Mr. Speaker, I think we, we know how important uh, uh, it is uh, that uh, workers across uh, across Ontario, uh, real, frankly across Canada, are, are safe, Mr. Speaker. I'm, I am pleased, of course, that the WSIB is on a sound a sound footing, uh, Mr. Speaker. I know that they are the primary mechanism by which we are delivering uh, uh, the paid sick days right now. But having said that, again, Mr. Speaker, I can't imagine that the member opposite would want the government House leader uh, deciding whether a private member's bill should pass or not. It really is up to the member to do what other colleagues on his side of the House have done and what colleagues on this side of the House have done, advance that private member's uh, bill, advance it through the committee, gain the support of a, of a majority of the members on both sides of the House, and a bill will pass, Mr. Speaker. I, I, I can't reiterate this again. At no point is I, as government House leader, going to order whether people should vote for or against a private member's bill. I'm very pleased by the fact that we've caught up uh, through COVID and that we're up to date on our private member's bills. I'm very pleased that we've broken records on the amount of key and private members bills that we have passed and I know how passionate the member is on this and I know he will do the work that is needed to get this bill through committee and if he's successful get a majority Response. support in the house to pass them the next question the member for Ottawa South uh, my question is for the deputy premier speaker and uh, my question is about the planning and preparedness of this government for the response to COVID-19 so in Ottawa, we're on day two of not being able to book a second appointment for people over 80. It's been that way since 9 a.m. yesterday. And I know the member from Nepean's phones are ringing off the hook too. So one hour, Order. one hour, seniors were able to book their vaccines, one hour. And this is especially frustrating Minister of Heritage, come to order. for seniors over 80 who've been trying to book their second appointment, who had a problem with their first appointment. And then there's a whole bunch of seniors, and I know the member from Nepean knows this as well too, who didn't get a second dose appointment. It's still not working today. So to the Deputy Premier, can Ottawa seniors over 80 get a commitment from you that this problem will be fixed by the end of the day? Minister of Heritage, come to order. Minister of Health to reply. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And I can certainly advise that we have a very successful online booking centre, which is now being used to accelerate second doses, uh, which you have referred to. As a matter of fact, over 102,000 were booked just yesterday. However, we are aware that there was a clinic configuration issue that arose yesterday in Ottawa that allowed some individuals to book into clinics that did not have available appointments. However, we were asked by Ottawa Public Health to take a pause to fix the situation. I understand that the situation has now been resolved. Member for Ottawa South. Well, thank you, uh, Deputy Premier. And I, I do want to say I, I don't think that it's up yet. 
um, and it's still very frustrating for seniors. But I would like to ask another question about planning and preparation for COVID-19. And two weeks ago, almost two weeks ago, the Premier, when he was talking about the reopening, really had nothing to say about schools. There was no plan about opening schools. Not a plan. Nothing. And then the next week, on the Wednesday or Thursday, he says, I want consensus, so he fires out a letter that's an ultimatum. We still don't know what's going to happen. Parents don't know. Educators don't know. It's really unfair. And what it shows is this government hasn't taken an approach to education that has any planning involved with the partners. It's not like we didn't know that we might open up schools in June. It's not like we didn't know that in April. No plan. Question. So, Speaker, is there going to be some sort of plan coming forward for schools so parents and educators will know what's happening this summer and in September? To reply, the Minister of Education. Of course, Speaker. It's why we announced some weeks ago the grant for student needs, which the, the member opposite knows is the principal funding vehicle. In that announcement, we confirmed a $1.6 billion resource for COVID-19. That includes the continuation of asymptomatic testing. Order. It includes the doubling of public health nurses, of cohorting, of active screening. And of course, includes the support for additional staffing and custodians and educators in the schools. Mr. Speaker, we've also unveiled Minister a supplemental Heritage, program. Minister of Heritage, come to order. Member for Ottawa South, come to order. An $85 million program, the largest summer learning program in Ontario history to support more kids to do credit recovery and to help them reach ahead for courses in the, in the year ahead. Also, more support for tutoring, for math, and areas of literacy and numeracy, trying to strengthen those learning gaps that have grown over the pandemic globally. And, Mr. Speaker, when it comes to Response? our school board funding, there's a $560 million net increase year over year that underscores our commitment to safety and to quality learning in September. The next question, a member for Hamilton Mountain. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. McMaster Children's Hospital in Hamilton is seeing a dramatic increase in children seeking mental, uh, medical help for mental health issues. This past fall, twice the number of children are, were in with eating disorders and substance use is issues, while the number of youth being treated for suicide attempts has tripled compared to the same time this time last year before the pandemic. I hear from families uh, across the province who have absolutely nowhere to turn. Before the pandemic, access to mental health services uh, for children and youth was already at a crisis point. Now we're seeing the demand for mental health services rise even higher as the pandemic continues. According to Children's Mental Health Ontario, there were 28,000 children and youth on wait lists two and a half years long for mental health supports. Speaker, my question, question. is simple. What is this government doing to protect our children and youth in the province of Ontario as this pandemic continues to drag on? Mr. Pell. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you very much to the member for the question. We are certainly well aware that there is an increased need for mental health and addiction supports, not addiction so much for children, for adults, but for mental health supports for children, youth, adults, as well as seniors. This is something that we have addressed with our Roadmap to Wellness, which was launched just before COVID struck, but we now know that as COVID itself, uh, we deal with that physical aspect of it, the mental health uh, issues will remain for many years. So we have been helping our children mental health uh, supports by increasing their funding by 5% last year to allow them to hire more staff to be able to reduce their wait list. That is something that we are working on today. We will be having an announcement very soon about additional supports that we're going to be putting into this sector because we do recognize that those needs are acute and the wait lists are long. Thank you very much. Uh, point of order, the government house leader. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Just two uh, quick points of orders. Uh, uh, inadvertently, I uh, forgot to seek unanimous consent uh, for members to wear the pin uh, uh, symbolizing on, uh, Italian Heritage Month, so I'd seek unanimous consent uh, for members to do that. Government House Leader seeking the unanimous consent of the House to allow members to wear a pin recognizing Italian Heritage Month. Agreed? Agreed. Government House Leader. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, pursuant to Standing Order 9G, the afternoon routine tomorrow shall commence at 1 p.m. Member for Scarborough Southwest on a point of order. Thank you, Speaker. I would like to, uh, on, on the first 
ever Filipino Heritage Month celebrated in Ontario, I'd like to wish the Filipino community and everyone across this province a very happy uh, Filipino Heritage Month in June. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Question period has come to an end. Next, we have a deferred vote on the motion for third reading of Bill 283, an act to amend and enact various acts with respect to the health system. The bells will now ring for 30 minutes, during which time members may cast their votes. I'll ask the clerks to please prepare the lobbies.